One of the things that I find believable about the Bible, and I believe the things which are said in the Bible, maybe not exactly as they're said, but I, the general principle that's there, and I believe the Bible because it's filled with people like me and you and everybody else around here. We have the crazies like Peter, who are all gung-ho to do things and then kind of forget what they were supposed to do, and then those who are very stalwart and those who can answer God's call without any really trepidation. At least that's what they tell us in the Bible. And one of the things that I have found over the years is the thing that I call the paradox of faith. The paradox of faith, at least to me, are those things or activities which are best for the community and yet may not look like community building activities. There, were year, there was years ago when one of the leaders of a church felt a call to ordination and the church felt that it was important to send him out into the world to become a priest and to do all sorts of things that he was called to do even when that meant that they were sending away one of the pillars of their community. And what's ironic is that that is more empowering to the rest of the congregation than people care to admit. Or maybe the other thing that we, we know personally is that as we reach out, we look outside the doors and become more appealing. But it's not the care and maintenance of those who are in here that brings people to church. It's dealing with the people who are out there, which of course makes sense, because if they're in here, then we don't need to bring them in here. Or, in fact, most importantly these days is allowing humanity and allowing people to be humans who are in our midst is very empowering to those in our community in a world that demands perfection all the time, a place where we can simply be who we feel we are called to be is important. A challenge of our faith that we may feel at the intersection of faith and the world is making sacred sense of secular advice and practice. We all know the sayings that apply for all, and sometimes without regard to their source. Some friends of mine years ago used the phrase, that's what doesn't kill us, only proves to make us stronger. Yeah, that's a fun one to think about. Because, of course, that also means that we're going to go through pain and torture before we get to the far end. Or maybe we've heard somebody in our society say, knowing yourself is the first step to real growth. Or better, practice makes perfect. Scripture and the liturgical practice of our church help reinforce that latter adage more than we appreciate. Practice makes perfect. And I would say not that we will ever be perfect this side of heaven. The way we worship and the words that have been chosen help reinforce scripture and the truth of God that means something to us. Repeating the story helps us to not forget the eternal truths when those eternal truths butt up against society and the tensions which are all around us. Repeating the story helps to provide us hope when life seems hopeless. Today, I feel called that we should take a look at Peter and his interaction with the one who we know on this side of Easter and on this side of the Bible, and who they will find out is Jesus. In this story, we hear the touchstones for those in that moment, the things that reinforce what God has done and that Jesus has taught them. And one of the oddities that I find, though, as I was reading and preparing for this sermon, is Peter, 
who will be heralded as the cornerstone of the Christian church is the one who is having the most difficulty. Peter, the cornerstone of the church, is the most human of those of the disciples. And we know that Easter and the events leading to the resurrection, and also, I should say, in Holy Week, are filled with Peter. We remember the Peter of the story who, had, who pledged unwavering support for Christ and even denied in his time that he would thrice deny Jesus. And yet, as he was a being human and warming himself over a charcoal fire, he gave up on Jesus. And because of that, he was cut to the quick. So fast forward today, some number of weeks, and while we believe it's three, possibly because of our calendar, it's not certain how long has transpired between the crucifixion and today's story. Jesus met, Peter met Jesus and implicitly pledged unwavering support and commitment to his commission as leader of the Jesus movement. Today we see that commitment manifested in him and the disciples going back to what they did before they knew Jesus, faithful people that they are, they went and fished. And there's no explanation, it's just a declaration. Instead of fishing for men, Peter was simply a failing fisherman in today's story. As Jesus, and I believe that as Jesus, Peter feels he is failing because he has caught no fist, that nagging voice inside him may have said, you are crazy to believe in Jesus. Which then, of course, might lead him to lose hope. And in that moment, he finds his touch tone. Jesus is with him at that charcoal fire, preparing a meal for Peter and the disciples. I wonder, did Peter have a deja vu moment in that moment? At the charcoal fire, meeting Jesus again. I know that I would have. In this story, we hear that Peter has a confirmation and reiteration of his true calling in the thrice asked question. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than those random things that are around you, the boat, the fish, the things which you have amassed in your life? Do you love me more than these, those people that you are leading, those people who you call your friends and your disciples? Do you love me more than these? than the love that others have for me. Peter, asked, Peter is asked by Jesus three times, do you love me more than these? And Peter is cut to the quick again, because in that moment, Peter remembered his commission. In that moment, I hope and feel that Peter realized that he can get it wrong along the way, but as long as he tries to be God's witness, nothing that he does will be for naught. And that's not just a good story. It is the story of the gospel. It is the story that we carry with us as a touchstone for our day. And that story and the point of the story is that with God and Jesus, there is always hope. The good news is our messing up may not be a failure as long as we return to God through the touchstones of our life. This story applies for us today. We are given and have things and places that remind us of our mission, this church, the people that we have met and worshiped with and been friends with over our entire life. We are asked to shift from our pursuit of self-preservation, of doing what is comfortable like those disciples did and went fishing 
to that self-awareness of our place as people of God called into the world to be witnesses for God. By understanding how we work in God's economy, and that is how we allow ourselves to build connections with those who have different strengths, those who have different skills and abilities. Look around this room. Are we all alike? Thankfully, no. Because if, it were, if we were all alike, it would be a very boring place. We are called by God to surrender our self-importance, to make sure that we become more important, to make sure that we don't make ourselves more important than our mission. Because we are, in fact, perfectly made and called by God exactly as we are. Our story today helps us to remember that we need to learn and trust and be vulnerable. And that those two things, trust and vulnerability, are intertwined. As we go in God's, grow in God's grace, we remember God's promises and the risk that God made making a mistake by calling us and Peter and all the disciples. God invites us to be vulnerable so that God can allow us to be more accessible to those who are searching, even when they don't know what they're looking for. God challenges us to look outside ourselves and the things which we hold dear, to find new ways to relate to our community, to live in places where we can find new friends and invite our new friends to understand God at work in our lives and to extend ourselves without regard for others, their motives or methods, as long as they look for God. One of the things I believe that we have learned over the years is that those who come into our midst and are most empowering to us are least like us are least like us because, let's face it, how do we grow if we are all alike? God doesn't demand that we are perfect. God just demands that we be faithful. In the story that we heard of Peter, God reminds us that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are already there, like Jesus on the beach preparing breakfast, making preparations and waiting for us to respond to the call and to be present. Thankfully, God knows exactly what we are and being ourselves with all our warts and flaws and all is what God needs for us to be, to be faithful and to be willing to let God work in the things that we do because God is the one who is in control, feeding us and leading us forward helping us to remember that God is in control and that all of God's people, as fallible as they are, are brothers and sisters today and forever. Who is God inviting you to reach out and to look and to help in the, day, in the days that lie ahead? Only you and God know. Amen. Amen. Amen.